So Lincoln, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into the future, can you please tell us a little bit about your own background? Where did you grow up? Yes, I was born in, uh, in Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape in a township called Kwazakele. And I grew up uh, uh, in Kwazakele and I did all of my uh, uh, junior schooling uh, in the townships of uh, Kwazakele. I went to a Bongweni primary, a Zigweni uh, secondary, and then at the Mzunzundu secondary. So up to uh, junior certificate, I was uh, in, uh, in Kwazakele Township in Port Elizabeth. And uh, tell us, what was your dream career when you grew up? My dream career was uh, being a lawyer. Uh, and I made this decision under, unfortunately, uh, bad circumstances because I was a, a detained uh, prisoner uh, during the state of emergency uh, in the 80s. And I thought that, uh, you know, a pursuit of justice and fairness would be a good career for me to follow. So that's when I did dream of becoming a lawyer to represent many of the people that I saw were suffering under injustice. Right, and I see you studied law and an LLB at Rhodes. And, yes, indeed. And later on, WITS and uh, Rao, and you, you even earned international accolades at INSEAD and Henley, I believe even Harvard. Yes, indeed. And my, father was a, yeah. my father was a, uh, a prime believer in lifelong learning and instilled in me at a very early age this pursuit of knowledge uh, to extend yourself uh, in terms of your, your knowledge, uh, to test your own perspectives, uh, to get talent in terms of your beliefs. And I found um, the experience of traveling and studying in different environments with different colleagues, different faculty has really enriched me on my journey. So if I count correctly, you, you attended um, seven universities over 22 years across three continents. So can you tell us um, what is your best memory from your educational journey? I think the one seminal moment was a lecture given at Harvard Business School by the late Professor Clay Christensen who gave us a lecture on how will you measure your life. That was a turning point in my life because it made me to kind of think about my future and challenge me to really connect with my purpose. And my purpose in life is to grow young leaders across the continent. And from that moment, my, there was so much clarity in me about what I needed to do in my life and therefore that moment I think stands out over all the other incredible moments, wonderful institutions, wonderful faculty and fellow uh, students. But that moment with Professor Clay Christensen does stand out for me in my career and in my studies. No, um, Lincoln, Professor Christensen unfortunately passed away I believe earlier this year. Um, yes, indeed. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that letter? What exactly did the letter say? So his letter gave us um, his own recollections of their uh, get together, uh, reunion as it were. And he found that at their reunion, a big portion of the class were successful, but they were estranged from their wives, they had no relationship with their children, and they had no balanced life. Another portion of the class was in jail because of the pursuit of success at all costs and people getting into unethical behaviors. And therefore, what he was challenging us uh, to do is to reflect on how we would want to measure our lives at the end of our lives. Will it be the perks? Will it be the shiny objects? Will it be the money or something more deeper? And I told myself that actually, 
I do not want to go the path that he had described because many other people had fallen on that path and I wanted to carve a different path for myself. And therefore, I felt that that, that story and that lecture resonated a lot with me and made me to reflect on the changes I needed to make in my life and my orientation. And tell us, Lincoln, who inspired you in your early days? There were many people who inspired me. Um, leaders like Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Susulu, and many other African giants. But the most influential person who inspired me was my father. Because my father challenged me and my friends at a time where we were very angry. Angry young people trying to bring the apartheid system down and to make the apartheid system ungovernable. But he challenged us to say, if you want this new future, how would you lead in that future if you don't invest in yourselves to become better human beings, to become more knowledgeable, to study and uh, pursue your studies? He was saying, if we were brave to take on the might of the army, we must also be brave enough to have good grades and have a good um, you know, character and well-rounded uh, as people. So my father uh, became that inspiration. And he had this view that one day I would study at Harvard Business School. At the time, we didn't even know where Harvard was. All we wanted was to fight. So when years on, I ended up at Harvard, I could honor my father, although he was no longer there, uh, because he could see far ahead of where I needed to be. Now, Lincoln, I believe you started your career as a candidate attorney at a law firm. And then you, yes, became, indeed. you became the spokesperson at the Ministry of Education under Mandela in 1994. Yes. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that period when you were a spokesperson for one of the most important departments in the country? It was a very challenging environment. I think after the first 18 months in a law firm, uh, it was a great law firm, Tittle, Thompson and Hayson, but I felt that I needed a challenge. And I was in Brazil at a student's conference speaking there and I got a fax saying I must come to the Department of Education. When I came back to the country, met the minister, uh, that gave me a new challenge. There I was very young. Uh, working in a new government that was trying to create something new and being among those early ministers, Minister Dalla Omar, Minister Bengu, and all of those, Mr. Manuel, and then uh, President Mandela and others. The, the environment was conducive for learning. You could watch the behavior of leaders that you admire and you could watch their commitment to a purpose bigger than themselves. And I learned a lot as a professional in those early years. It was fascinating, it was exhilarating, but also challenging because there were times where in that portfolio, as you correctly point out, there would be conflicts at universities and I would be sent to mediate those conflicts. There would be marches uh, to parliament. I would receive those representations. I would go to uh, schools where those schools were segregated to help with the department to end the segregation in those environments. We would have to write um, policy papers on how to change the education system. So I got a lot of my grounding from that time. And people like Professor Chabani Mangani, Professor Smusso Bengu were instrumental in, in how I became grounded uh, in those early years. And, and then, Lincoln, you joined the Banking Association in 1997. What attracted you for, to banking all the way from education and government? My life has been a lot of um, amazing, uh, fortunate events where somebody recommends my name to somebody else. Uh, because when I joined the Minister of Education, the minister was got a recommendation from many people about my name. So similarly, Banking Council, uh, Bob Tucker, who was the head of the Banking uh, Council, 
uh, got a recommendation from Mrs. Sheila Sisulu, who was a fellow advisor to the minister. And he was starting a new venture of creating an industry body that was going to be influential in creating a new banking industry in the new South Africa. And so my name came up and I met Mr. Taka for the first time. I'd never thought I would get into banking. I never thought I would be in the banking industry. And there I was at the core of the banking industry and the changes that were taking place in the banking industry and learning uh, at the feet of a giant like Mr. Bob Taka and learning from many of the CEOs of the major banks at that time. So that four and a half year period was a period of learning and growth for me to understand the industry from uh, those doyens of the industry, like uh, Mr. Bob Taka, uh, Mr. Jaco Mare, Mr. Forslo, and, and all of the other CEOs. And tell us, Lincoln, it's, you mentioned something very important. Your name came up, you were recommended. What would you attribute your success, your secret to success to? Um, is there one, maybe one quality or one skill that you would say is important for success and especially for future leaders? My, I remember something my father once told me. Uh, and that was in everything that you do, you have to completely apply yourself and give of yourself and give your very best because there's always somebody watching, which means that in everything that you do, you are creating an impression, whether the impression is negative or positive, but there is an impression that's been created. And so my father encouraged me to give my best and just do what I need to do. The reputation itself will take care of itself. And I found that throughout my life, just focusing on what I need to do and giving it my all has meant that various people over time get to notice. But the difficulty with that is that you have to keep on being consistent in that. It can't be a show. It can't be something that you're doing uh, only to be noticed. You must do what you need to do with the best of your ability. And there's always somebody watching. And that's a message I would give to future leaders is in whatever you do, be the best you can be. Give, give your all. Be diligent. Be professional. Uh, focus on excellence. And then, you know, uh, what other people will see uh, will come naturally from that. Now, Lincoln, in 2001, you joined Standard Bank as a senior manager for corporate banking. And for the last 18, I think almost 19 years, you've been uh, occupying very senior positions all across the continent at Standard Bank. Um, what would you say was the highlight? Maybe a couple of highlights during your career at Standard Bank. I've had many highlights in Standard Bank, uh, but if I could mention a few, when I was asked to take on a province and run a province, the biggest province for the bank, the Gauteng province, that was a big, big, big highlight uh, for me. Also, when I started in Standard Bank, I was given three countries uh, to be responsible for, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. And there I was very young, uh, very inexperienced, working with some of the most experienced and knowledgeable bankers on the continent. They embraced me. I learned from them. And I learned very early on the skill of learning and leading at the same time, that you don't have to know everything. But if you work with people, you get a lot of ideas from them, you can uh, do amazing work. The third uh, major highlight was when I was given the responsibility to run all of Standard Bank branches across all provinces and all of its channels. For a five year period, that was an amazing uh, experience. Uh, I got to travel the length and breadth, breadth of this country, visit every uh, town where there's a Standard Bank branch, visit its customers and got to know thousands of people that I worked with and thousands of clients. And then I had an opportunity to work again 
on the continent, looking after five countries and working with uh, amazing people in Nigeria, Ghana, DRC, uh, Namibia, and Angola. That was, again, another highlight. And lastly, where I am now, working with uh, amazingly talented young people uh, in card and payments, working on innovations and digital uh, you know, products and services for the future. So although I've been in Standard Bank for close to 19 years, no year has been the same. No one job has been the same. I've been constantly uh, you know, challenged to keep on growing and, 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 and broaden my horizon. And Lincoln, looking back over your career, would you say there was a major turning point or maybe a number of turning points? I think, Doc, the biggest turning point is when I realized that the thing I'm most passionate about is leading, that I really wanted to be a leader. And I realized that that's my core calling. That's what I should invest in and try and be the best I can be as a leader, regardless of the area, regardless of the geography, regardless of the challenges, regardless of whatever it is, whatever the context would be, I'm given an opportunity to lead, and therefore I must take that opportunity and be able to lead uh, multidisciplinary teams, teams across different geographies, teams across different uh, race group, religions, or, or age groups. That's been the joy uh, for me in, in my career. And Standard Bank has given me that opportunity. It's also given me an opportunity to always be myself. I think a lot of people lose themselves when they get into a corporate setting. They put on a corporate mask, uh, thinking that this is how they should appear, this is how they should look, this is where they should speak. But I've always just been myself. And I've uh, treasured the environment in Standard Bank that allowed me to be my authentic self. I bring myself to work. And I've always just wanted to be the same person, whether I'm with my friends, I'm with my family, or I'm with my colleagues. And that's really been the joy uh, of working at Standard Bank over these uh, close to 19 years. Now, Lincoln, looking into the future, what does the future of leadership mean to you? My biggest uh, dream is to grow a cohort of young leaders who will take uh, Africa into a new uh, you know, growth trajectory, who will learn from all the mistakes that are currently being made by leaders, who will give a new meaning to leadership, where it's about the people you lead, the people you serve, and not about being self-serving, not about being corrupt, not being, about being selfish. So, so I've started this journey of grooming and working and motivating young leaders across the continent. And so for the future, for me, uh, it's quite bright because what I have seen is very inspirational. Some of these young leaders are really amazing across the spectrum in different corporates, in, in public sector, and others in, as in, entrepreneurs. I want them to be the midwives of Africa's recovery and Africa's rebirth. That is the future that I see for myself and for this continent. And tell us, Lincoln, what have you learned from your own journey, your own leadership journey, that you consider most important for building future leaders? There are a number of things that I've learned on this journey. Uh, I'm going to mention a few. The first one is knowing thyself. You know, the Oracle of Delphi say, know thyself. Knowing yourself is very important as a leader because it's very difficult to lead anybody unless you're able to lead yourself. It's very difficult to change anything unless you're able to change yourself. So I have had to learn a lot about myself and change myself and lead myself. The second thing I've learned is the importance of understanding why you want to be in a leadership role. Not what you tell others, but the reality as to why you want to lead. Is it the perks? Is it money? Is it power? Because whatever the reasons are, they're going to shape many of your decisions. 
And so I would hope that most people lead for a higher purpose, not narrow, selfish uh, interests. The third uh, thing I've learned on my journey is really the importance of getting feedback, getting feedback from uh, a close circle of advisors, uh, getting feedback from your clients, getting feedback from your team, getting feedback from colleagues, because we all have uh, blind spots. Unless people are able to point out those blind spots, we will not be able uh, to succeed. The last two things I've learned on my journey, the one is the importance of hearing different perspectives, that the more senior you get, the more you have to be discerning, the more you have to be more cerebral and understand that there are different perspectives. In making decisions, you must have the benefit of a broader range of perspectives. The last uh, thing I've learned is the importance of what I call a, 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 a view where not everything is black and white. Not everything should be a binary choice. Not everything should be either or. That as you deal with more complex things, faster change, you must adopt a both and mindset. So the paradox leadership mindset is one of the things that I've had to learn uh, very quickly. Uh, to, just to give an example of what I mean. If you are asking a business person now, what should you be focusing on? Should you be focusing on saving your business or should you be focusing on uh, building the business for the future? Now, it's very easy for people to try and find one or the other answer. But sometimes something that looks contradictory may be the right way to go, to actually carry both thoughts and invest in both and don't immediately get to one answer and leave with that answer. Because it is important to save the business today. But you just save the business just for today and then it's dead tomorrow, no one to help you. So investing in the future of the business is also important. So that leadership paradox mindset is one of the things that I've certainly learned. And it is quite critical now during this crisis of COVID. Now, um, Lincoln, when you speak to aspiring leaders, what is it you tell them about social media? How should they navigate social media to build their own leadership brand? This is a very difficult issue because I, I, my views are probably more conservative because I have a sense that Social media is a tool which you can use towards particular aims. If you're not clear about what the aims are, what tends to happen is that social media sweeps you away and you become part of their agenda rather than you have your agenda. So I don't think that you should build a brand that exists in social media but doesn't exist in reality. What social media should be doing is to augment or amplify what actually exists in real life and not have two lives. One is a social media world and, and life and another is a real life. So I've tried to have my life and live my life in the real world and use social media to advance whatever um, ideas I have. And because for me, my mission is to grow young leaders. That's how I would use social media, to grow young leaders, to help young leaders. Beyond that, I don't think that there's more to social media that I personally want. I don't want self-promotion. I don't want to be profiled or any of these kinds of things. But that's just a personal viewpoint, and that's a stance I've, I've adopted over the years. Now, Lincoln, what is your advice for future leaders in terms of challenges? What, what would you say are the biggest, some of the biggest challenges future leaders are likely to encounter in their career? There are a number of uh, things that a lot of uh, young people grapple with. And I talk to a lot of them about these things. One of the first ones is this notion of influence that leadership is not a title held 
it's an influence felt. So in other words, when you go to a social setting like a corporate or an institution, you are coming to an environment of other human beings. So your growth or your success depends on your ability to influence people. So which means we have to engage with more people to have more chance of influencing. But the flip side is that you must also have the humility to be influenced because you can't be a one-way street. So a lot of people battle with being part of a team, managing team dynamics, making sure that your individual success is met with the team success. That's one of the things that many uh, leaders are going to grapple with. The second one is how do you deal with change? Because change is not planned. So your ability to adapt, your ability to be resilient, your ability to be able to, 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 to change yourself depending on the circumstances and be more successful in the new circumstances is going to be key for many, 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 many leaders. The third one probably is how are they going to deal with all the new technology? Because all these technologies are there and they're going to be going faster. How do you harness those technologies to make sure that the business is successful, but it's also doing more for society, more for the environment, more for the community and your people as well. So how one has a relationship with dig digital technologies are some of the things that young people are going to uh, deal with. When they talk about the fifth industrial, industrial revolution, it is here. It's not something that's in the future. It is here. It has an impact. Some of our jobs may not exist. So you have to build new skills. You have to build new ways of adapting in order to remain relevant into the future. And Lincoln, if you were to design a curriculum for future leaders, what are some of the new skills you would want to factor in? Certainly, I would start with empathy and compassion. I would want more leaders to lead from the heart. Because this notion that you can only touch people in the mind and not connect with their heart, I have proved it wrong. There, there is huge benefit with connecting people with people at a human level. We are missing that, particularly during these times uh, of uh, accelerated change, where a lot of uncertainty. People want uh, leaders that they can relate to. They want leaders that are accessible. They want leaders that are relatable. And so this is an important part uh, that I would certainly uh, infuse with uh, leaders. The second one, particularly with business, is for people that can understand a broader mandate for business and not only about making profits. How do we create a more balanced scorecard where success is success of society? success of the environment, success of the community, success, success of workers, success of other stakeholders and shareholders. I think the narrow uh, make money at all costs, make profit at all costs mindset is outdated. The last uh, uh, new skill uh, I would certainly uh, get uh, people to, to do is how to manage multidisciplinary Uh, teams across different geographies because the micromanagement uh, style, the command and control style where you want to see everybody is not going to be there in the future. You're going to be working with people, some are in the office, some are working at home across different time zones. So the ability to work and manage people in that way is very, very important as a core skill set. And Lincoln, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart? <laughs> I, I always worry because I have so many people I've worked with who have gone on to do some amazing things. But if I had to choose one, and probably because we've worked uh, for so long together, is a, is a colleague called Mrs. Uh, Itumeleng 
Monale. She is a top-notch data scientist uh, in Standard Bank. And, and there she is, she's done amazing things uh, within the organization, rising up to the highest levels uh, of the organization at a professional level. But the same person is an amazing mom uh, to three beautiful children and is an amazing uh, wife to an amazing man, uh, Winston. And also is somebody who is there for young people uh, and also got um, you know, recognized as one of the best 200 data scientists in the world. And the reason why I'm mentioning her story is because I have this thing that I want young leaders to do uh, or to embrace is this notion that you must be a well-rounded person. And Itumeleng's example is that she, didn't, she wasn't given a false choice of being an amazing executive, but not be a good mother. Or being an amazing mother, but not be a good wife. Or being an amazing, a good wife, but not be an amazing entrepreneur. She's got all of those. And you want more and more uh, of people to have everything that they seek. So, so many of the people I've worked with, I've judged their success on the basis of what is happening in their family life, what is happening with their studies, what is happening in the community, how are they um, uh, faring at work, are they role modeling, are they grooming other leaders? So, Itumelen Munale and many other leaders uh, I've certainly worked with uh, who are in amazing roles. Uh, is the thing that gives me joy every day. I see many of them uh, taking on roles. Some of them are CEOs now. Some of them are with, with the central banks. Uh, so there are so many of these people who've done amazingly well, and I'm so proud of having been part of their team. And Lincoln, who are the role models of leadership that you have encountered in your career or maybe in your learning journey that you would recommend future leaders should learn from? There is an amazing guy. I mean, there are many, but I'll, I'll pick on one person. Um, Teto Nyati. Teto Nyati for me represents the kind of human being I'd like to be. The kind of senior leader I'd like to be. Because he, he exemplifies what success, but with people, with others uh, means. He exemplifies what excellence uh, means. And throughout his career, he's had a great track record. He's grown people in the process, but also as a human being in his family environment, his contribution to society, his, uh, his own ideas about what can be done in society and so on. That's the kind of model I would like many young leaders uh, to certainly look up to. And Lincoln, how can our listeners connect with you and where should they follow you? Um, I am on uh, LinkedIn and then I have my own blog, which is uh, Leadership Conversations, uh, www.leadershipconversations.co.za. And that's where I um, share a lot of my thoughts. And I've also got a YouTube channel uh, where some of my leadership videos uh, you know, can be seen. Now, Lincoln, last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own lives? Treat everybody the way you would like to be treated. And treat, treat people with respect and dignity regardless of their station in life. Do not judge people on the basis of their rank or seniority or sense of importance. I found that those lessons I was given by my father, what I used to observe with him growing up, applying them in the corporate world has come naturally. In that way, you get to know everybody from the security guard to the person who is helping with, uh, you know, in the kitchen to a teller, all of those people can relate and resonate with you. And if you're just being normal and grounded, 
uh, you know, the sky is the limit. I've certainly found that no promotions, no new assets, no new, uh, you know, accolades could change who I am and how I was brought up. And I've uh, jealously clung to those things to say, what would my parents say? This is not how they brought me up. How would my uh, priests uh, that were there when I was young, Reverend Haya and others, how would they look at me? How would my coaches, like um, uh, the, the people who were there for me, Mr. Kofu and Mr. Majola and others, how would they look at me? Uh, Mrs. Mopa, all these people were very important in how I was brought up. So they, nothing then should change when I now am in, a, in an executive position. I should treat everybody with respect and dignity, and treat everybody the way I certainly would want to be treated. Whether a person is uh, young or old, black or white, a uh, woman or man, it doesn't matter. You must treat people with respect and dignity. Well, Lincoln, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future of leadership and reminding us that respect and dignity are key to success today and tomorrow. So thank you so, so much. It's an honor to, to speak to you and keep up the great work that you're doing. Thank you.